Yes. Yes, yes. Hello. Ladies, gentlemen, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. Today we're going to be talking a whole lot about two things. Thing number one, the CrossFit Games Instagram is back and active. It's been back for a while now, but it hasn't been active. But now it's back and it's active. And that's important. That's an important difference to make. Thing number two, also this week, like literally within the past week, not only has the CrossFit Games been back on Instagram and active, thing number two, Dave Castro had an interview with doctor and former CrossFit Games athlete, Julie Fouché. So uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely some stuff for us to talk about. Now, hopefully... Those of you who are watching right now, the audio is a little bit better than it has been previously. I know a lot of people are saying that the audio levels are a little bit jank, jacked up maybe, maybe even other words, uh, but I, I've been working on it, played around with it a little bit this afternoon, uh, played around a little bit last week, and um, I'm hoping that it's a little bit more equalized. So if the audio levels are, let's say, garbaggio, let me know. Let me know, and I will. Uh, I will work on. It. I'm going to keep working on it. But as a one man show, the one man show must continue. We must go on, everybody. We must go on. Much like my heart from Titanic. What's that singer's name? <laughs> I don't remember what that singer's name. Anyway, the point is, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about das Instagram for CrossFit games. So the games Instagram is back. They follow one person, by the way, in case you're wondering, it's CrossFit training. That's who they're following, but they have nine posts and uh, each of these posts is kind of interesting in its own right. It, it, they, they're kind of laying the groundwork for the 2020 CrossFit games, which are going to be taking place um, July 29th, Wednesday, July 29th through Sunday, August 2nd. That's what it says literally right here. The CrossFit Games will be held the week of Wednesday, July 29th through Sunday, August 2nd. So, you know, they they have uh, they have a, an event to prep and an event to promote and uh, a whole situation to market. And that's exactly what they're doing here. They're talking about the event. The first post that they posted was this kind of look back. Um, it's hard to tell because of where uh, I, I sort of did the picture in picture here. But you can see it's it's a sort of photo sliding montage of the various years of the CrossFit games from the ranch all the way to um, Carson, California and into Madison where it has been over the past few years. They've also posted um, this uh, little sort of short highlighting thing uh, going towards women um, feminine. I think they called it. Uh, it has this poem by Amanda Barnhart, Good stuff. Anyway, if you're not following them, 53,000 followers, that's really sad. We've got to add some followers. So if you're not following the CrossFit Games Instagram, you should probably get on that action. You should probably start following the Games Instagram because honestly, Celine Dion, that's who I was talking about. Celine Dion. Uh, yes, her heart will go on and and ours will as well. But if you're not following the Games Instagram, you know, they used to have like 2 million plus followers on Instagram and they do not any longer have that many followers. So I, I strongly, strongly suggest that uh, you get in on that action. Now let's go ahead and, and switch gears. I don't want to spend all day talking about the game's Instagram. Um, I don't want to spend all day talking about Dave Castro's interview with Julie Fouché. Uh, let's go ahead and see if we can bang this out nice and tight and quick. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. So Dave Castro is the director of the CrossFit Games and co-director of training at CrossFit HQ. Um, we've talked a whole bunch about him on this, this channel before in the past. Not really interested in talking about him at any particular length um, for you know various reasons. But mainly the thing is like there really isn't a lot to say anymore. I think I've kind of said what I've had to say. I'm not sure what's changed over time. But here we are. He did a very rare media appearance. He doesn't do these very often, but he did one with Julie Fouché, um, which my guess is uh, there was one of the MDL ones, which are the CrossFit Health Level 1 certification courses that happen at CrossFit HQ 
in uh, Santa Cruz where they bring in a whole bunch of MDs. My guess is that Julie Fouché was there to help assist with that. And Dave was there because it's part of his job. And they kind of got together. Now, before we go any further, by the way, as usual, today's episode brought to you by water in a mason jar. As all water should be. Wide-mouthed mason jars. And we talked about mason jars last time, by the way. This is one of those that has the uh, the measurements on it. This is dope. See, it even has like a little line that says, if you're going to freeze, only fill up to here. Because when you freeze things, as I learned in elementary school, when you freeze things, they expand. And you don't want to overfill it and freeze it and crack your very wonderful mason jar. So shout out to Mrs. McGonagall. Not Professor McGonagall, Mrs. McGonagall, my science teacher. So here we go. I took uh, I took a whole bunch of notes. I have them written down here, and there's a few things that Castro talks about during his interview with um, with Julie Fouché. There's a few things that he talks about that I I definitely 100% agree with, and I think are really dope. And if you have not seen the entire interview. I would, I would honestly recommend you go either watch it or listen to it. Uh, the name of the podcast is Pursuing Health, uh, Julie Fouché, F-O-U-C-H-E-R. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's a good listen. Um, overall, I think it sort of puts Dave Castro in a different light than maybe he's portrayed. Uh, usually, he tends to come across as a bit of like uh, the bad guy, as a bit of a dick. In this interview, it, he sort of humanizes himself a little bit. He talks a little bit more about his his family a little bit. He talks a little bit about you know the changes at the games and how it's affected his personal life. He talks about his like day to day schedule, which is really interesting um, for various reasons. But the interesting things for us, the stuff that we want to take a look at, is sort of his interaction with and maybe a look at how he deals with the changes that have happened over the past couple of years at the games um, and at HQ and sort of where he's at and what he's trying to do specifically in relationship with the 2020 CrossFit Games and the sanction events. So the one clip, and I, I don't, I, I have a bunch of timestamps. I'm looking down because I have my notebook here and I have a bunch of timestamps we're not going to go over all of these timestamps. I'm not going to play a whole bunch of different clips from the uh, the interview because, like I said, you should probably go watch it. And also, I don't really want to get demonetized, so I'm not going to risk it. But I do want to play uh, one like 10-ish second clip. We're going to take a look at that uh, in a minute here. And it's it really, uh, to me, gives a great insight into who Dave Castro is and how he sort of carries himself and what his thought process is. Um, but the the context, let me set this up for you. The context here is Julie Fouché has asked him essentially, you know, now that regionals are gone, now that there is no workload on you, Dave Castro, director of the CrossFit Games, to write all these workouts, travel to all these different events, what is your interaction with any of these other events outside of the CrossFit games. So now that we've kind of got that queued up and should be in the little bottom corner here, we're going to go ahead and listen to what he has to say. I don't watch any of them. I don't pay attention to the programming of any of them. And I don't really know what's going on with any of them. Okay. Should we continue? Okay, let's continue. Okay. It is not, and I won't travel to any of them. <laughs> With my time, time is precious. Everyone's time is precious. Your time, my time, anyone's is. And how you prioritize it and what you do with that is uh, is very special. And I don't, I am not going to go to any of these events that I'm not responsible for or running as a fan or as a spectator or if. So that's that's about the gist of it. Um, that that's the that's the main piece that I wanted to take a look at because I think it, it really does a good job of illustrating his mindset in the shortest clip that I could possibly pull. Um, one of the things that he makes really clear is that a big positive for him now that this whole thing is different is that he doesn't have to travel constantly to regionals to the open announcements. And I understand that travel schedules are very, very tough um, on the on the, the, you know, the people that are traveling. It's expensive. There's a whole lot involved in that. But 
you know, I, I, I see what he's saying there. And, and he kind of says this, he says that he won't be traveling to these events. It's not his idea of fun. He won't be traveling to events that he's not responsible for. And that's one of the things that kind of comes through this interview is that he takes his work very seriously. And I mean, I've said it before, uh, I'll end up probably saying it a whole bunch of times, but again is, you know, the, one of the things I have a lot of respect for Dave Castro is the fact that he does his work exceptionally professionally. He takes what he does very seriously. He's really critical, self-critical. And we'll talk about that in a second. He's very self-critical about his job and the quality of the output that he has. But when I say he's super self-critical, it to me, when I hear him talk about, I don't, I don't pay attention to what workouts they do. I don't pay attention to what they do. And the following part of this story is essentially that he doesn't you know, people will ask him for help from various sanctionals with programming, and he's not interested in helping them. He's like, this isn't my show. It's your show. Do whatever you want. Um, you know, I, I don't want to come to your event. I don't want to help you with your event. I'm not interested in programming for your event. You know, I take this seriously to like this level. I have one event. He says specifically, I have a CrossFit event that I am responsible for, and I'm going to spend all my time focusing on that. I get it. Totally makes sense. The part that I, I think kind of creates something that we've seen the end result of a few times is this, this echo chamber where, you know, I feel like there isn't necessarily the, the situation within the organization for the CrossFit games where people can actually legitimately say, no, that's a bad idea because, you know, Castro himself says, Hey, I don't pay attention to what any of these other people are saying or doing. I'm not studying their workouts. I'm just creating from my experience and what I'm doing and sort of iterating off of what our experience has been as an organization. And to me, while I understand his professionalism and his take on, Hey man, this is my lane. I'm staying in it. I, this is my job. You know, I get to do this. I'm excited to do this. This is what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm going to treat it like my job. Uh, I get that, but I also think the fact that he doesn't have any external, communication he doesn't have any sort of real external eyes on what he's doing doesn't it doesn't necessarily take away from what he's doing but it certainly prevents him from sharpening his axe as much as he possibly can because honestly one of the things that has seemed to be lacking from an outsider's perspective into crossfit hq and its organization one of the things that has been seemed to be lacking is this idea that you know looks like nobody can really say no it looks like no doesn't travel up the chain very well you know if someone says no i don't think that's a good idea if let's put it this way if the if no i don't think that's a good idea if that type of pushback is actually heated in a meaningful way because obviously there are ideas that don't make it out into the real world but if no i don't think that's a good idea is actually heated in a meaningful way I would love to see the ideas that didn't make it and because they would probably be crazy. They would probably be absolutely insane. What do I mean by that? Well, we've had, you know, paddling and swimming combination at the games. Basically every time there's been a swim event, it's been swimming either as its own thing or just paired up with like obvious other long slow distance or cardio style or monostructural movements right only twice has swimming been paired up with something other than running or biking or paddling and those two times were the pool event where they swam and did bar muscle ups and then the beach event where it was swimming and um burpees and kettlebell thrusters so Outside of those two examples, every other swim event has either been its own swimming thing or swimming paired with paddling or swimming paired with running or swimming paired with, you know, running and biking once. So the fact is what we're looking at is, you know, a, a not not necessarily a stagnation, but certainly a, a an angle, right? Definitely an angle definitely a bias, definitely a preference, not necessarily a stagnation, but perhaps there was someone in the organization at some point that was like, Hey guys, how about we don't do the same thing that we've done over and over again? How about we have 10, the 10 best CrossFitters 
in the world up until this point based off of the test that we've had in 2019. And instead of having them swim and and paddle for the umpteenth time, what if we have them not and have them do something else, right? What if that was what if that was the thing, right? And so that's the real question. If if no is actually something that happens and is respected, if that feedback and that pushback and that criticism internally is actually something that's respected, I'm really curious what the uh what the ideas are that aren't that aren't being you know put out there. And by saying by the way that he doesn't sort of pay attention to or listen to or see what the other events are doing. I, I'm not 100% sure that's genuine for a couple reasons. We've seen events at the games and at regionals that are really similar to other events that are going on in uh, in the CrossFit space. Um, one very obvious example of this is the four-person team. Uh, Filter 150 has been doing four-person teams forever basically since the first year that they started, which was before HQ started doing four-person teams at the Invitational. So we're talking about a, a really core evolution of how the CrossFit Games team format has existed was being done at a local level for years before it ever showed up at the big stage. Um, while the programming for regionals and the games has always been and will continue to be the true cutting edge of what it is to be competitive CrossFit, there are events that have shown up at, at the games that are, are sort of, you know, uh, reminiscent of other events that have shown up at other of, uh, uh, or other workouts, other events, other, you know, competitive moments that have shown up at other non-sanctioned and sanctioned events alike. And I think it does the entire system a disservice for Castro to sort of brush it off. Um, and I don't want to read into it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to assign a positive. I'm not going to, I'm not going to just guess or, or sort of put the most negative possible reading on this because, you know, that's not really the best way of, of doing things. But what I'm going to say is at the very least, it, it kind of positions what he does mentally in his own head or at least seems to position what he does mentally in his own head like above better than not at the level of everything else which is in a competitive sense absolutely true he's got a bigger budget he's got a bigger payday he's got the best athletes he's got the entire you know thing sort of behind his cutting edge of what the event looks like and feels like but at the same time like you're telling me that you cannot learn a single thing like you're not interested as someone who, and in this interview, is really honest about, hey man, I'm super critical, I hold myself to a very high standard, I hold other people to a very high standard, I, I put myself out as an example of how I hold myself to a high standard so that when I hold other people to a high standard, they understand that it's not just, I get it, I, I completely understand the organizational perspective, the leadership perspective of what he's doing, but to say that you're not gonna pay attention to what other people are doing, and just brush it off as something you can't necessarily learn from. Really, like, there's nothing. There's not. There's not a single thing. You know, even if, by the way, that relationship was opened in the other direction. Let's say that relationship was opened in the direction of sanctional speaking to, you know, HQ. And there might be, you know, there might actually be reasons why this doesn't happen. Like there could be contractual reasons, or there could be whatever you know, organizational reasons why this doesn't happen, but even opening that, that line of communication the other way and talking to the sanctionals from a perspective of what can I teach you instead of just letting them watch and learn, maybe there can be a, a direct line of communication. Even that would be incredibly positive, I think, for the whole system. So that was probably that specific moment of him saying, hey man, I don't want to go to these events. I don't pay attention to these events. I don't know what's going on to these events. It's not my idea of a good time. And, you know, I have an event that I'm responsible for, and I'm going to just think about that event and be responsible for that event. On one hand, I respect it. 
you know, you're staying in your lane, you're really excited about what you get to do, you're focused on establishing yourself and your event uh, as like the top tier and doing it as best as possible. But at the same time, shouldn't there be something? Shouldn't there be just a little bit going on there? And he mentions, you know, oh my, you know, he has, he has other Instagram accounts. Obviously his main account doesn't follow anybody. And yet he seems to be very well tuned into what's going on on social media. So you know, he obviously has other social media accounts. So when he says, I'm not paying attention to it, it either comes across as like, I'm too good for this shit or that's disingenuous. And he actually does pay attention to it in some way, shape or form. And I don't know which one it is. You know, I don't know which one it is. Uh, maybe it's a mixture of both, but either way, there are a couple other things that he talked about. A couple other things that I found uh, to be interesting. Um, you know, for him, he mentions that so so julie asks him you know what's the biggest positive like what are the biggest positives from these changes and his answer is you know listen we are we are about a year and a half out of the sort of bomb going off of no more regionals everything's changing opens direct line qualification etc cetera, etc cetera. that happened after the the 2018 game so we're about a year and a half out of that so I imagine he's had some time to think about this. He's had some time to sort of figure out exactly where he stands, exactly where he emotionally is dealing with this and how he's feeling about it. Um, but, you know, he he says that his favorite thing, the best thing of, of these changes, the best part, the biggest positive of these changes is that it's teaching people to deal with change. And... I can I can think of a few reasons why that's that's just not the best positive thing like you know I get it that's a really important lesson to learn from these events it's a really important you know life that's like a meaty life lesson that you just got to get your hands on hey man things change it's sometimes sometimes the things I love the most aren't necessarily going to stick around and be the same forever totally fine but saying that that is the best part, that's the biggest positive from these changes doesn't really ring true to me. Um, you know, either, again, either he's saying that there really aren't that many great positives, like, you know, he can't think of how it's positive for the athletes or how it's positive for events or how it's positive for CrossFit. Maybe it's not Maybe to him it's not. Maybe none of those things actually exist. Um, or he's just saying that like, you know, the life lesson involved, it's about the friends we made along the way, right? That's basically what he's saying. Um, you know, he talks a little bit about, you know, the the programming and uh, he mentions this concept that he has where uh, he actually really likes the fact that the games have been like a dynastic sport. And what I mean by that is that the same people tend to win over and over and over again, right? And the men's side, we've had only three champions in the past 10 years or so. Um, on the, you know, between Rich and Matt, that's eight champions. And then in between the two of them was Ben Smith. So that's nine years with three people, you know, two of whom have won, you know, an basically every games that they participated in and then on the women's side we've had something very similar you know katrin won a double um annie has won a double t has won a triple so we have a very dynastic sport and he talks about that and i maybe made up that word dynastic but i'm just going to use it because it sounds dope and you know sports journalism is about making up words for things and since i'm going to pretend to be a sports journalist i'm also going to pretend to say that I'm, I'm making that word up for us but he says that he really likes that. He actually thinks that that's, that's a positive um, about the programming. And to me, I have a hard time parsing that argument. I have a hard time understanding exactly why he's, he's saying that um, for a few reasons. It, to me, it sounds like the same argument that, oh, the people who do best in the open do best at the CrossFit Games. And therefore, because of that, the open is a valid test of fitness. And it's like, yeah, okay, maybe the open is a valid test of fitness, but just because the people who are best at all of this stuff do the best there doesn't mean that in 
in and of itself, it is a valid test of fitness that it cannot improve and it cannot change. And that's kind of what he's saying. What he's saying with the CrossFit Games champions is, you know, if, for example, we had all these different champions and one year, and he actually does this, you know, Chris Spieler wins and then Tommy Hackenbrook wins, and we have these big disparate sizes of athletes, he, he essentially says, to me, that means that would mean the programming is flawed. The fact that we're finding the same people over and over again tells me that this that these people have what we're looking for. And and that that sounds a little backwards to me. It sounds more like you could make the argument the other way just as easily, that you're just finding these people because that's what you're looking for. And and maybe again, maybe, just maybe, it's because Matt and Tia are the fittest people on earth who the thunk it. But at the same time, it, it you can't sort of it begs the question if you use these past results as a way of arguing the the same uh, you know the validity of your test because the results are similar year after year after year. So I'm not a big fan of that argument. Um, the other thing that he talks about a little bit here, um, a couple things that I agreed with. I know it's, it's it, that's surprising based off of what I've been talking about so far, but a couple things that I agreed with one is that, uh, he thinks one and done in the open is silly, which I don't think he actually uses the word silly, but, um, you know, you get it. That's basically what he's saying. He's basically saying that the one and done in the open is, is, you know, not the best strategy. He goes, listen, guys, this is part of your sport. This is your competitive sphere. This is what you're choosing to do professionally and if you're saying and you're holding as a as a badge of honor as a source of pride that you're a one and done guy in the open maybe you're not taking this as seriously as you should be and to that i kind of sort of agree i think one and done is is decent and a good approach a really healthy approach for you know a normal person like me like i'm not going to make time out of my weekend to repeat open workouts over and over again even if i make it to the gym multiple times over the course of that weekend I'm not going to I'm not going to make it an effort to to do the workout a second time because it doesn't matter. But for an athlete, you know, uh an athlete like Sean Sweeney comes to mind. Like Sweeney's not a one and done guy and the end result of him trying and trying and trying and and putting his best foot forward over and over again is that for the first time he's actually qualified through the open to make it to the CrossFit Games. He's actually improved his placing in the open significantly over the past couple years. So I get it for a professional. That's super important to do. Um, and I, I respect that. Another thing that he talks about is encouraging athletes to sort of lean into the idea and really embrace the idea that they're, they're in a sport. You know, he doesn't like it when people are talking about, um, the, you know, exercise for time or competitive exercise thing, which is like, come on, man, it is. It totally is competitive exercise, but I understand what he's saying. And I, again, I, I respect it because, the way that you speak to yourself, the words that you use to describe what it is that you're involved in, the words that you use to talk to yourself, these things help shape the way that you actually experience the world. And so if you are on one hand behaving and taking this thing super, super duper seriously, but you also deep down inside believe that you're not doing a real sport or you're not a real athlete or you're actually just exercising. You get to work out for fun type thing. Like if you, if you hold both those things, this mental weight is going to take away from your physical potential. It's just going to be the way it is. Now I've heard some of the best crossfitters in the world talk about, yeah, my job is to work out. It's different though. It's different. They all understand that they participate and compete in a sport that is, you know, very, very much requiring the the tip top capacity that a human being can output over the course of the competition. And they also understand that, you know, they're basically meatheads professionally, right? So there's a balance there. There's a balance there. And I kind of see what Castro is saying about this idea that you shouldn't sort of talk down to your position or your role or your profession, because that will end up bleeding into the actual work that you end up doing over time. Um, and they, he talked a little bit about the drug testing, uh, about the season and how things have changed with the drug testing over the seasons. Uh, now that regionals are gone, essentially 
it, it doesn't sound any different. Honestly, like, you know, the fact is they can't test everybody. They can be very smart with who they test and where they test. They can test at sanctioned events where there's a whole big combination of people who ne not necessarily would be together in any one place. I know, for example, um, over the past like few years, even while regionals was going on, Wadapalooza was a really big and common testing portion where the you know the fact that so many athletes from so many different parts of the world were coming together in this one place they could just schedule three or four days of just full collecting samples from hundreds of athletes and that's exactly what they did like i know that that i know for a fact that that was going on and you know they talk about uh, one of the things that they started doing that really upped their game in terms of their drug testing was they started testing earlier in the week when people were registering for regionals. My my guess is they're starting to do that at sanctioned events as well, sort of knowing when athletes are going to be showing up for the sanctioned events and testing them then. Um, it's still not great, and even he admits it, yeah, it's not perfect. It would be silly to say it is perfect. It, it seems to be getting better because they're doing more focused testing. They're doing smarter testing. They're catching people who are just so, you know, so clearly just f finagling their fitness. <laughs> Man. And, uh, and you know, it's not it's not 100%, but he also said something that I, I, I kind of agree with as well, which is that it's more, it's not that the top people are, are dirty in my opinion it's you know the top athletes in the sport are clean it's more likely when you look at especially the um in terms of the motive it's more likely that the second tier or the a minus tier athletes are the ones that are using right it's the ricky garrards who are justifying it by saying well everybody else is doing it and this is the only way i get to be competitive and then showing up and competing right it's it's those types of athletes who are able to justify it in their minds they have the motive to chase the people who are at the top um that's something that i talk a lot with a lot of these athletes about about sort of where does the testing lie what parts of the games like which athletes should they be looking at more and more frequently who's really obvious and dumb about their usage who's you know who's maybe sort of like sneaking underneath it. and that's like the the games probably gets a thousand times more people pointing fingers than we can even imagine and so you know they don't follow every single every single clue or every single um you know snitch i guess is what you'd call it but at the end of the day i, I think they're doing a, a decent job at least especially recently with how much they've opened up the transparency on their testing about just sort of announcing the fact that there are negative results before they, they finish the sanctioning process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I think they've, they've opened it up a little bit and the fact that they follow up on some tips, um, after their own investigations, that's kind of how you have to do it. Uh, let's see if there's anything else. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, he does, he does say, and this is something that I agree with him. Um, this is something that I, absolutely do not envy uh with his role with dave castro's role both in the community and in the space this isn't necessarily something that he has created by by putting himself out there as much as he he has and if we take him at face value he doesn't like to be the center of attention he doesn't want to be the face of this thing he says it in his book a bunch of times he says it during this interview a bunch of times again i just looking at his behavior, that doesn't really ring true to me. It doesn't make any sense to me that someone who doesn't want to be put in the limelight the way he is and has the power to stop it never stopped it. That doesn't make any sense to me. But taking him at face value, he says, I'm not interested in being, you know, in the limelight. Um, but he he does understand that he's a very polarizing figure in the CrossFit space. And the the quote that he has is i'm in a position to make hard decisions and sometimes decisions have consequences and sometimes people get upset over them and uh you know i get it i get i get where he's coming from there i i do not envy him that that position because it's not an easy place to be to be that guy that's like you know 
all the focus is on this one guy, even though there's machinery behind the scenes that's creating what, what it is that we've, uh, we've been experiencing. Um, but he also isn't doing himself any favors by making himself that guy. So I don't know. I mean, when, when you, when you put yourself out there as sort of the main bad guy, you know, that you are the, the, the main test, you're the, you're the antagonist to the CrossFit Games athletes, protagonists, you know, you are the, the Rocky hero's journey that they have to overcome in order to become the champions. You're kind of doing that one to yourself. You're kind of doing that one to yourself, but either way, overall, again, if you have not watched this interview or listened to it, I encourage you to do so. It is a great look, really insightful look into who Dave Castro is, into what his mindset is, his professionalism. There's a lot of interesting things there to respect. There's a lot of things there that you can parse about and just like tear apart if you really wanted to be very critical about it. But overall, you know, he he sort of paints a much more human picture of who he is and what he's doing and and uh and how he takes his work very seriously and also apparently he's a pretty decent runner because he's trying to run three miles in under 20 minutes which is like not super good if you're a high school cross-country runner or like a track star or something but it's pretty decent for a crossfitter um so yeah that's that's cool i guess uh yeah either way lots of interesting things in there he has a pet donkey uh at the ranch that he likes to walk, which sounds cool. Um, you know, I can see why he'd, he'd get along. You know, they're, they're, they're probably both very stubborn. Um, they, they see eye to eye in that, I think, but either way. Yeah. I don't know. The interview is worth watching Julie Fouché, uh, pursuing health. I think it's episode 131 or something like that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, there isn't as much reason for us to particularly care about what's going on with Dave Castro's circumstances. And I mean that in the best way possible because for a very long time, if you weren't paying attention and very close attention to what Dave Castro was doing, you were totally out of the loop with what was going on with the CrossFit games. The first announcements for the open workouts were on his pages. The first announcements for the games workouts were on his pages. Like he was the conduit. And again, it doesn't ring true to me that someone who's behaving that way is also saying that he hates that attention. That doesn't make any sense to me. Those things are incongruent. They make no sense because you control both those things. So do you want it or do you, do you hate it and force yourself to do it for some reason? I don't get it. But either way, uh, I'm not... And haven't been the biggest fan of Dave Castro. I can think of a hundred reasons why. But at the end of the day, I think it's a really good thing that we don't really have to care about what's going on anymore. The fact that he can show up on a podcast and it's like not the biggest news in our sport is very, very good. It cannot be a one person show and survive at all in any sort of meaningful long way. Like there's no long-term health to this thing. If it's only attached to one person, like I'm trying to think of a sport that would happen. Imagine if golf was had like a Dave Castro. I don't even know what that would look like. Don't worry about that. Don't imagine that doesn't make any sense. My point is this is a good thing. It's a good thing that the machinery is working with him behind the scenes with everything behind the scenes the thing that needs to happen is more transparency and more openness to criticism from outside the organization, more of a growth and you know iterative mindset of what can we learn from all of these other events? Because I'm telling you, there's a lot that you can learn. Even if you are at the top of your game, there's a lot that you can learn from the other people participating and playing that same game. So anyway, watch the podcast, Julie Fouché. Dave Castro. It's pretty good. It's on YouTube. It's on, I've downloaded it on my uh, podcast apps as well. And I listened to it there. Uh, I've probably listened to it two or three times preparing for this. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. There's a whole lot going on in our sport. Easy to miss some of the most interesting and exciting stories. That is what I am here for. Let's see if there's any questions or anything in the 
comment section here. Uh, let's see. Uh, Celine Dion. My brother is letting me know that it's Celine Dion. My heart will go on. Uh, the Mason Jar of Water is more interesting than Dave Castor. Thank you, James Wallace. I really appreciate that. Um, let's see. Um, it's a bit of a letdown that the director of the games isn't a fan of competitive CrossFit. Uh, Rock Caves F. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see that. Um, it, I can understand that. To be fair, uh, competitive CrossFit does kind of sort of get boring. Also, to be critical, that's kind of their fault for making it boring. There's a lot of situations in which competitive CrossFit is really, really fun to watch. And when you have six heats and five of them don't matter. Okay, sorry. Four of them don't matter. You're not doing yourself any favors, right? When you when you when you program the triple three at regionals and literally seven hours of the first day of competition is watching people run on a treadmill, that ain't it, Chief. That ain't it. Okay? That ain't it. Let's see. Uh Enrique says dynastic is totally a word. Autocorrect fixed it for me. That's what I'm talking about. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, let's see. John Lee personally don't mind sanctionals doing their own thing. If everyone follows a template, it biases fitness towards that template. Let there be a variety of tests and see who gets to the games. I absolutely agree. That's one of the things I really love about the sanctionals is that they all have their own little flavor. We saw on water rowing um, at Sid. We are seeing you know the the first China event this year. I think it was Panda Land at the end of last year. You know they had a very uh, you know culturally sourced uh, event that had some sort of like Chinese strength implement or something. I forget what it was, but the events are all sort of leaning into what makes them unique. Whether it's their geographic location, whether it's their history, you know. Um, you know, uh, we saw Dubai do an entire event using movements that they sort of tailored and, and used in previous years that haven't necessarily shown up in a lot of other uh, CrossFit competitions like the uh, deck squats and the A jumps. Like these are really cool little things that, that just are adding some flavor to the whole thing that makes these events unique. And I 100% agree with you on that one, John. I think that's really important. Um, Ed Lima says, I didn't get to listen to the podcast, but I was wondering, did he ever touch on the subject of ever possibly having the games outside of the U.S.? Women's champions have come from Iceland, Canada, U.K., Australia. That's a really good question. He did not. Uh, Julie did not ask him about that. I'm, man, I don't have any sort of like in, insight, any sort of like secret knowledge about what's going to happen. But if I had to project out into the future... The games are in Madison for another couple of years. The Reebok deal is up at the end of this year. There's a lot of things that are in flux. One of the things I think that would be hugely invigorating for CrossFit as a sport is if the games moved around, a la the Super Bowl, right? Different cities bid for the right to have the Super Bowl there. I think you could definitely have interest in different places to host the various events and it would take some of the organizational burden away from CrossFit. And I'm, again, I'm, I'm sort of sourcing from various things here. Greg Glassman has said he doesn't want to be in the event space. He doesn't care about being an event organizer. I get it. That's cool. It's a pain in the ass. He says he loses money on it every year. Okay. Fair. Why not? Instead of spending all of your money on putting it on, take bids for licensing the right for other organizations to put it on for you. And suddenly you have, you know, uh, uh, event organizers like the sanctionals that all have already proven that they can put on events. You know, they start putting in bids and you might see the, the games show up in somewhere in Europe. You might see the games go to South America. You might see the games go to Australia over time, right? That's like, it's just, to me, that's a natural evolution of where this thing goes. I don't see any reason why it should stay in the same place over and over again. I would hope that it doesn't evolve into something like the Olympics where people spend millions and millions of dollars and, and never make any of that money back and just completely collapse their entire you know national economy over trying to host the prestige of the Olympic Games. Um, but, you know, I have some opinions about the Olympic Games anyway, and that ain't it either. You know what I mean? Whatever. Uh, I think that's about it. I hope that uh, I hope that helped, guys. Again, I just want to put this out there. If you have not yet listened to or watched the interview and you're interested in sort of getting a more 
humanized take as to who Dave Castro is and, and who he, he thinks he is and who he, and how he portrays himself. That's the way to do it. Go and check out that podcast with Julie Fouché. There's a whole lot going on in our sport. Easy to miss some of the most interesting, exciting stories. That is what I am here for. Hope you guys enjoyed this. This weekend, we have a whole new sanctional coming up, the Norwegian CrossFit Championships. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have a live stream. If they do, I'll be watching it. If they don't, I won't be watching it. And um, I'll find a way to tell you guys about what's going on. I will see you guys next time. Have a good night.